Okay. So the telegraph is going to you gonna give us a date for that? Mid 1800s. Mid 1800s. Okay, that's a good fudge enough. Okay, any advance on mid 1800s? Yes, you are. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, you are. Allison. Allison. Okay. So I've got um, age of like humanism in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. With a feeling that people before that didn't do that. I, I, I mean, I mean, it's an interesting point, but what makes it distinctive in your mind? So you would think of things like, for instance, which the postal service, which comes in, a kind of postal service comes in around that time. Okay, so we've got eternity, we've got 16th, 17th century, we've got 19th century, yes? So the first written record, so writing, which we will talk about at the beginning of the information age. But again, we, we've got the, the notion from... Um, uh, from the IBM ad, or the question is, when is the growing agreement? Now, one would think that with the first writing, people probably didn't agree, wow, this is an age of information, would be my hunch. Though, again, there are many people who date it from that time. All right, so we're now eternity, the beginning of writing, you want to put a date on that? All right, we'll let you off the hook. Uh, we, we've got the 16th century, we've got the 19th century, any advance on that? Where are we going next? Yes, you are? Yeah. Vilma? Okay. And so what would you say was the key to that sharing? So mass production, which you would think of the prints. Okay, so the age of information begins with prints. Yes. Good bit, Adam, and where do you like to say when that was? Yes, sir. So it's kind of a date, but yet it's a continuum in a way. Or it's a okay, so literacy, which is important, and we will talk about that. Yes, you are? Um, Eva. Um, like so the printing press? Now, we'll, we'll, again, we'll talk about that. One thing to bear in mind when we do is, do you think those people actually talked in terms of information? What did they think they were circulating information? Well, this is a question we'll ask as we go on and look at those theories. Okay, so we're still way back. So everything. So, so none of you think you really are in the age of information. The age of information was long ago. Any advances on that? Yes. So the internet. So not the telegraph, which has been called the Victorian internet, but the internet itself. Want to put a date on that? Okay, we're a little busy on our dates here, but that's all right. That's right. Okay, so we've now finally climbed up to the internet, which we could, depending on where you where you want to look at the internet, put in the seventies or so. Yes. Well, a nice point in two things, I think. One is clearly, well, now we're talking about the spread of technology. So not simply just when technology comes into being, because television was around a while. But when you can be sure that most households, not all by any means, but most households would have had it. But the other, again, is the self-consciousness of saying information technology companies. That is, companies like IBM starting to think of themselves as information technology. Again, part of the general agreement is people start to talk about themselves in these terms. Because although Gutenberg did a, did a lot, um, he probably didn't think of the printing press as an information technology, or as Gutenberg Inc. as an information technology company. But by the time IBM put that out, people were starting to think of themselves. Just about, not in any big way. Okay, so we got, we got up to the 1970s. Anyone think it was later than the 1970s? Yes. Okay, so again, like the television story, but now saying it's, but it's not, it's the internet, it's that broader access to a slightly different world than the world of television, presumably a more interactive world than the passive world of viewing television. So, not just the dawn of the internet then, but somewhere in the spread, so when would you like to put that date? Okay, so that's in fact when it, went, when it stopped being a research tool and went out into the world. Yes? Mm -hmm. but, but, which is good, I mean, the library, which we'll talk about, isn't it terribly important and significant in this. Um, but, uh, again, do people think of libraries as information? It's a question we'll have to bear in mind. Um, and that is, are we putting our categories in their heads, which may be fine, but are we actually going to ask them what they thought? And if we do, that, do we get a slightly different, different vision? Okay, so we've got a range from the eternal, though that probably wouldn't be one when we talk about there being growing agreement, right up to probably the 1990s. Anybody going later than that, saying that any of the changes since then are significant enough? Or are we really saying, no, we're going to say the internet, whatever that is, is probably it, and after that, yes? Um, I actually put the internet up to probably Okay, because? Um, the so the web rather than just the internet. And what are you thinking of the advances? Uh, Web 2.0 is not really a technological design in a way, but it's a kind of concept. And what do you mean by that? What do you mean by Web 2.0? Twitter and Facebook. Twitter and Facebook. Okay, so now we're going like, okay, so now you are starting to claim you're the internet generation. Okay, yes, you want to say. So speed became important. Okay. And that's the reason we're just going to say we started to think of ourselves in that way, but of course it puts, starts to say, well, what's IBM up to then by saying it's growing? But good, good point. Yes, sorry, do you want to say? Okay, I think two very important points. Now, one is just the general one that we tend to think that, you know, when things happen to us, well, boy, then that's the whole world, you know, the world is changed because we've got it. Um, and it's not, that, you know, therefore, looking at this specific question, you know, I mean, there was, for instance, I mean, there was internet quite happily here, um, you know, in the, in the 60s, in, 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 uh, around this campus, but nobody knew about it. But it's not until it gets out there and gets significant that we would want to start to say that an age has been created and perhaps one that can be defined. Now, we've got two shifts. Is it being defined by the technology or is it being defined by the content of the technology or the content allows it to, to, to pass around? One last comment and then we'll go on. What do you want to say? Um, 
Okay, now that's a very nice point, which I, which I will come to. Okay, so when, as we're in an election year, do we start to think of information as politically significant in particular? Okay, so we have a whole range, and a whole range in there, not only of dates, but I hope you understand, and understand it too, a whole range of different reasons for saying, let's call this, or that, or us, or them, an information age. So we only have one single reason, and that's not a bad thing. Jeff, you want to tell me? Mm-hmm. Okay. Right, so, and there's reasons that we could think of, think, think of that. No, let, let me throw out one particular one that I find interesting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two in the morning? Okay, so, very good. But then here's someone who comes along, perhaps the first person to use the phrase. He's this weird English schoolmaster, and happened to write a lot of sermons and edit a collection of books called Elegant Extracts, and in one of his essays he sits up and he says, but the books are easily procured, yet even in this age of information, there are thousands of lower classes who cannot read, and then he goes on to talk about the difficulty of getting to them. Now, one of the things that interests me about this is what Jeff talked about the other day, is we're sitting in the middle of a century which in many ways is almost unknown for its technological development. That if there were to be a conversation between Lil B and Vigesimus Knox, the answer to what's up, if you ask it in grand technological terms, is not much. By the end of the century, the steam engine is coming along. But it's not being used in any particularly wide and certainly in any communicative way. So we want to say, so why does this guy suddenly sit up and say to a very wide audience in his essays were republished over the years, well, we might think of this as an age of information. And these are issues that will be coming up in the, talk, in the course as we go along. One, which has come up today, just that last point about politics, is there was the growth of something that's grandly called the public sphere. That newspapers were spreading widely that um, the idea of public opinion, this idea that information in a sense in the political sphere becomes more and more significantly important. That is, people have to start, rulers have to start paying attention to what people think. They didn't have to do that before. And suddenly the idea that what people think, and therefore shaping how they think, understanding how they're made to think, circulating information, not necessarily first from people to the government, but from the government out to people, becomes particularly important. So that might be one reason. The other, you mentioned in person, is the organization of knowledge. Again, we're going to have a class on this later on. Suddenly things start to be organized in ways that we would recognize now. A topic that's come up already, the library is a significant marker. The modern library really comes into being to some extent in this century. The newspaper, as I said, the um, dictionary, Jeff will talk about later, the encyclopedia comes in in this century. So you get as weird Scotsman uh, Chambers, or you get the Frenchman Diderot and D'Alembert who we'll talk about, and I put him down slightly because it was unfortunate name, Paul William Smelly, but the Encyclopedia Britannica all come out just around the time that Knox makes that statement that this is an age, or sorry, the Britannica comes out just around that time, the other two were before, but the idea now that we kind of have access to organized systems of knowledge that almost anybody who has access to a library at least can have access to. And then finally, something that we mentioned this morning, but it's actually very important, is a legal decision. Donaldson versus Beckett, although, and we'll talk about this, copyright law was passed in England in 1709, and it's probably the first real copyright law that we know anywhere. Um, in fact, people managed to say that for various complex legal reasons, that things that had been in copyright before that law would remain in copyright eternally. And so they wouldn't let things be published. But in 1774, by a very narrow majority, the court ruled that's not true. There is a limited copyright, though sometimes you wouldn't believe that today, and this is very influential in the United States in this case. There is a limited copyright. After that, everything is free to be published by anybody we choose after 14 years. Um, so there's a huge, huge explosion, a profusion of books. If you look at the spike of book, annual book printing going almost all the way back to Caxton, it suddenly takes off in this year, in a window that's open for about 30 years for various reasons. So all these, but none of them are really driven by what we would call technologies, make enormous sense to why he would think of it as an age of information. And of course, there's one more thing that we have to talk about, and that is just the notion of revolution. He was writing four years after the American Revolution, which changed how people thought politics would be configured around what people knew. He was writing just before the French Revolution, and in fact, for a particularly dull and boring English schoolmaster, he took the side very vociferously of the French and was vilified and attacked for it. But he said, this is the right thing, the world has to change. So, when we start to say what makes an age of information, we want to think of looking beyond technologies, important though they are, and start to think, well, what are some of the other influences that are around? So if they produce, as Knox said, an age of information, the kind of question is, well, what is there in an age? What goes into an age? And what ages are? What do we call ages and why do we differentiate them? Uh, so standard classic ones are the ones that are brought up by the IBM ad itself. It wants to compare itself. with the age of information, as we look back, there was stone and bronze and iron. And in honor of Jeff, we can even go up to plastic, as he was talking last week. Okay, so these are ages that are more or less described by what? I mean, what kind of category is this? Sorry? Materials. So these materials, it's slightly odd, then, isn't it, that IBM should kind of skip from materials to information, as if they were all part of the same. Um, because, in, I mean, we can think of other ways. Jeff mentioned McLuhan on Tuesday. Marshall McLuhan, who gave us the notion, again, so what's the classification system there? Sorry? Communication systems, all right. So he's saying, look, the way we notice how the world changes is through um, communication systems. Or indeed, we could say, what kind of classification is that? Hunter gatherer to agricultural to industrial to post industrial. Production. Okay, so there's more or less economic production comes out. We're gonna, we end up when we talk about our, with a whole lot of posts because people can't quite work out. This was Daniel Bell, who almost managed to call it the information age, but he couldn't think what it was, so he called it post industrial. But notice these are all cross cutting systems. Uh, again, we get the weird Thomas Carlyle saying over the 19th century it was not a heroical, philosophical, or moral age, but an age of machinery. And we do tend to, again, cross cut cast categories, just as IBM does so Carlyle did back in England. But everybody starts to think of their own age as the age that's kind of going to take off and be the one that's really different from everything that's come before. Um, so we get something like this. What kind of classification system is that? Sorry? Sort of society, cultural, perhaps. I mean, it's terrible. It's the way in which we project ourselves back into history. It's something we don't really understand. We just call the dark ages and say we don't have to look in that. Um, or there's something like Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment. Significant, but in fact, if you ask an Italian when the Renaissance was, they will tell you something very different from if you ask a French person when the Renaissance was. Um, so we have these labels, but we don't always apply them very accurately. Or we could say something like sales, steam, jet, nuclear, atomic, and space, which is transportation systems. So we have this idea that society is shifting through ages, but when we start to look at them, they're all kind of cross-cutting because we can't really believe either that the causes that shift from one to another with any one of these categories, or any of the dates when they happen are all the same. So there's a kind of mishmash when we start. We, at the beginning, it kind of looks clear there's a series of ages, but if we spend too long thinking about it, we get a little confused, so let's not spend too long thinking about it. Um, okay, so how do we get from one to the other? And I think that there are kind of two standard answers that I would offer there, and one is it's a kind of evolutionary system. 
and the other is that it's a revolutionary system. And that those are two ways in which, hence we get terms like the internet or the electronic revolution, the information revolution. Now, one clearly is this kind of continuous idea that things change gradually. If you look back over time, you can say that one period looks different from another. But as people were going through it, life just seemed to go on. And then on other occasions when people were completely aware that they lived in a transformative moment and that things were very different. And again, that's how we in part think too about technologies. We like to tell a story that Gutenberg came along and gave us the printing press and there had been nothing like it in business ever before. And it changed society immeasurably. And we're going to want to ask, well, is that a reasonable account? Because that's often the account that was used to measure our own changes in society. Um, if we take that one, if we look at books, it's interesting to see how people talk about it. I mean, a lot of people talk about the book evolving as something rather than something that comes along with a slash. It's actually something that evolved. Evolved as what? As packets of information. And there's a kind of interesting cross here between a modern idea. You can be fairly sure most of the people who saw the book evolving didn't think of it as a packet of information. I mean, there are a lot of other things, but not that. But, oh, but this idea that the book is not something, and the book is a central feature of Western cultural change, um, is, well, how does it come along? Does it really change? And what forces it to change? Uh, again, Fairbairn and Martin, the great French historians of the book, say, well, what was happening was that there was a demand change in society. Here's a classic kind of economic view. That demand comes along and makes people respond to that demand. And so you get changes in order to satisfy the new need for information. More books and soon new, new, more newspapers were required. So here, we're not really getting an explanation because he didn't tell you how this demand increases, and that's something we'll have to think about. But they're saying demand is out there, and people rose to meet it. Um, a particularly influential among technologists story, a man called Kilgore, Frederick Kilgore, um, of the evolution of the book. Um, he calls his, his, his book the evolution of the book, and he talks about the need for available information had been steadily rising and was accelerated by the advent of Christianity. So along comes someone who says, again, it's need, and starts to argue what kind of need it was. And it's an interesting and tricky argument. Suddenly we want to say, well, those Christians, they had a need for information, but the Romans didn't, and the Jews didn't, and the Hindus didn't, and the Chinese didn't. They all just sat there and scratched their heads and said, I don't care what's going on in the world. But somehow the Christians were this wild evolutionary force that drove everything along. We want to examine questions like that. Say, well, you know, who's telling the story and who's telling about and why? And again, there again, it's a need. What's driving the need? Well, probably the Christians again. The need to find information more rapidly than is possible in a papyrus role form book initiated the development of the Greco-Roman Codex in the second century. The Codex. Are you familiar with the term Codex? Who can tell me what Codex is? You all know a Codex. Come upon them every day. The Codex is basically a bound book, something with a spine and pages in. We'll talk about this because it was actually a very significant change. I don't think Kildor has got it right either when or how it came about. But moving from the scroll to the codex, many people have seen, or some people at least, is more significant than printing. It wasn't a huge technological innovation. It didn't demand metal work, but very significant in particularly Western cultural development, but also in distinguishing Western cultural development from development elsewhere. So the codex is something we want to think about. And again, the question is, well, is that quite how we would explain it? So one idea is then that what is happening is technologies are coming along to feed this growing need for something that perhaps we would call information. And is that then what's happened to us now that just our needs keep growing? so that in some way our needs for information are greater than the needs of information of people in the past. That's the sort of question we want to ask. One way of looking at it then is in the egregious Stephen Fry, the sort of self-parodic Englishman, telling us uh, about printing. Uh, these are available on YouTube. They're worth watching because he does show how a printing press is used and how to do it. Um, but he says, glittering proof that a new information age was dawning. So he's sort of saying, well, there are lots of information ages, actually, or at least a couple of them, but this is a new one. So they're both ages of information rather than something distinct. But it's simply a sign that things are, you know, print is moving along in the same gradual tradition. That was a BBC series that came out in 2008. There was an earlier one uh, with James Burke, who's far more frantic than Stephen Fry and rushes around like a mad thing. But he will have nothing to this idea that, look, it's just one age moving into another in a gentle way for him. It's revolutionary. He called it the day the universe changed. And he claimed that printing transforms knowledge. So it doesn't just come along and make it more available or pass it around. It transforms it which is an odd way to think about what technologies do. But we want to think, well, how much do we talk about technologies today in that way? One of the books, or, or uh, we'll look at an essay by the very influential historian, Elizabeth Eisenstein, who shook up the world of history of the book by her book, The Printing Revolution in Early Modern Europe, and caused a furor um, by arguing that there was indeed a revolution. So we've got all this stuff to think about when we want to say, well, why are we in any way significant in our age? The question is, well, what, what makes us different from other ages? And how were they different from one another? And is it information? And is it technology that allows us to distinguish them? Or are there other things at issue? Let's just talk briefly.